Greetings. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Vernon, and I'm going to be talking about this. So I, I uh, am a tester by trade, and I've been uh, learning about coaching over the last few years, and I've started to blend those two things uh, in my work now as like a quality engineer or a quality coach or a tester. So I'm just going to spend, hopefully, less than 30 minutes talking about that now. And if you've got any questions at the end about anything to do with testing or coaching, hit me up. OK, so quick thing about me. So like I said, um, uh, that's supposed to represent coaching and engineering and things. Don't ask me why that icon why that came when I searched for it, but that's it. Um, and I've been doing this for like 20 years. I know what you're thinking, how can anyone so young and handsome looking be doing it for 20 years? But it's true, 20 years I've been doing it this year. Um, my coaching training was done through Barefoot Coaching. They are very awesome. I would recommend it if you are imp interested to hear more about that, let me know. That's not an affiliate link or anything. I just think that they're awesome and they're really cool. Um, and in a former life, I was Will Smith's virtual stunt double, and you can ask me about that after the talk uh, if you're interested in that. Okay, but on to the talk. So why do I want to talk about this? So um, what I've noticed is uh, testers these days are being asked to push out in all the different directions and do all the things. Um, and I want to talk about how coaching has helped make that much easier and much more effective and kind of compare and contrast what I used to do when faced with particular problems as a tester and how I deal with them now, I've got these new fangled fancy pants coaching skills. Okay. So, what I find myself responsible for now is the quality culture in a team. And so I found this very cool definition of what culture means. Uh, and it's an organization's pattern of response to problems and opportunities it encounters. So the quality culture, being responsible for the quality culture means I'm interested in our response to quality problems and our response to opportunities to improve or address or make the quality better. So that's what I mean when I say quality culture. Um, and so quality culture can manifest itself in a few different ways. I'm going to focus on the problems part of that definition. Um, so this is a, an agile coach who I follow on Twitter and towards the end of last year He seemed to go on a bit of a rampage about testing. I don't know what happened to this guy Maybe a maybe a tester stole his, his lunch money one day. I don't know But this says the notion of testers not being devs is odd to me Testing must be automated isn't writing an automated test coding Somebody who can't code can't create tests at all if they can code up a test, they can code up anything. There are no testers, just devs who understand testing. So that was quite, uh, you know, triggering for a few people on Twitter. Um, and then he quickly followed it up a few hours later with this. In my opinion, a tester who can't or won't write automated tests is like a musician who can't or won't play an instrument. Manual testing is ineffective, slow, error prone at best and the concomitant delays and gates severely hamper agility. Well, all right then. All right, Alan. All right, mate. What was his background? Um, some kind of agile coach, but I don't know what he was doing before that. I don't know if he was like a dare or anything like that. So my tester brain reacted like this. Like, how very dare you? <laughs> I've never been insulted so insulted in all of my life. How dare you? Now, if I'd faced that in, in teams, which I have, faced that in a few teams, I'd have been like, you son of a bitch. How dare, let me tell you a thing or two about testing. You are wrong, and here's why you're wrong, and you're a horrible human being, and all the rest of it. Now that is not super duper effective, as you may have guessed, because if you've ever done that or been on the receiving end of it, you know, if you're on the receiving end of someone telling that you're horrible and useless, do you usually reply, well, thank you so much? for telling me that. I had no idea. I will now fix my ways immediately. Uh, that never, ever, ever, ever works. And so this is where the coaching skills that I've learned can help. Now, I learned the coaching skills um, in the context of being an actual coach. So I would be one-on-one -on -one coaching somebody. And so that's a very, um, 
specific context, but I'm talking about taking those skills and just using them in the day to day. So it's not like I'm actually one to one coaching somebody, but I'm using the things that I learned there in that situation. So first thing about being a coach is unconditional positive regard. I am not talking about toxic situations. They're dangerous and you need to escape them one way or another. I'm just talking about normal, you know, somebody says something crazy or a bit flamey or you get a bit offended or whatever. You kind of say to yourself, do you know what? There's probably a reason for them saying this thing. They're not horrible. They just have a different set of experiences to me. So let me try and figure out where they're coming from. And I learned this, um, this idea on some training that I did. I think it was some ORSC training. I can't remember what that stands for. I'll probably remember by the end of the talk. But the notion is everybody is at least 2% right. So the question is, which 2% was he correct in his statements? Okay? So unconditional positive regard. That's the first thing that I'm trying to do instead of just telling him off. Next thing is listening skills. So I'm talking about active listening. Now, active listening is hard and it's draining when you really are doing it properly. But it's also like magic because when people feel heard and listened to, and even though I said listening, seen, you know what I mean, then people are feeling like it builds trust and they feel like, ah, I can relax now because this person understands where I'm coming from. Because a big part of active listening is like it says there, You've got to kind of pay attention, uh, withhold judgment, reflect, clarify, summarize, and, and share. And those, those things are like, like magic. So if I was faced with that kind of thing, this is, one, this, is the next, this is the next, this is step two of my coaching skills that I need to apply to uh, our friend Alan, okay? And the last thing is this concept of powerful questions. So powerful questions in a coaching context are around, um, are not about around my understanding. They're around me helping the person that I'm coaching gain some new insight. I don't necessarily need to understand whatever it is that they're trying to deal with or take advantage of. So the questions are designed to help them gain some insight. Nonetheless, outside of a coaching situation, those kind of open questions are really quite useful. So, um, in the, in the uh, spirit of not judging people, uh, I would probably try and steer away from why questions and use things like what, where, how, who, when, that kind of thing. And avoid questions that resolve down to a binary answer of yes, no, true, false. Get people to expand, okay? So, uh, back to our pal, Alan. So, unconditional positive regard. Hey, Alan, that was a little bit interesting what you just said there. Where were you coming from, my friend? And so, I, what I would do is I would start to look for like clues in what they said, okay? So there are clues all over this thing. So there's, he said it's odd to him. So what makes it odd? I have no idea. Uh, and he said, um, things must be automated. The testing must, must must every time really maybe we can play around with that um manual testing is ineffective what do you mean by manual and what do you mean by ineffective and so on and so on and so on and so on so there are the clues there are the threads that i want to pull on and i would then try and come up with some open questions these are all what and who kind of things what do you find odd about it um, what, what makes you think writing test code isn't coding? What does create tests mean to you? Uh, and what does tester mean to you? And so on and so forth. So here's a whole bunch of open questions that are based on who, what, where, when, that kind of thing. But try not to avoid why, because that's a little bit judgy. And I could do the same thing again uh, on this side. Um, so yeah. But why is this even important, okay? So that's the example. Who really cares? Why is this even important? Well, there are lots of, I say new, I've se I'm seeing a, a change in the market these days. Um, what we used to call testers, we're calling quality engineers and quality coaches and all, kind of, all these wonderful new 
new uh, times. Um, and what we're asking people to do is operate Instead of just at the point where we've got something to interact with, we now want people to shift left, or right, or up, down, sideways, all around, all over the goddamn place. We want the testers to impact the entire software development lifecycle. And there's a bunch of ways that you can do that. So you can be very directive, or you can be very non-directive. And if you're being very directive, you're teaching people. So as a tester, I spent a lot of time telling teams how to test, telling them that they were wrong, telling them that I knew best. No, that's not correct. This is the right way. Does anyone know any testers like that? Anyone? No? OK, cool. Just me. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got coaching. Now, one of the fundamentals about coaching is that I am not the person with the information to know how. You are as the person I'm being coached, OK? And so if I see a, a, a role called a quality coach, theoretically that means I can go and coach them on quality without knowing anything about quality. That is a hard sell in most businesses that I've ever been in. Okay? So usually what you're after is, is mentoring, and that's the kind of in the middle. That's where you can kind of say, well, I do have experience in this thing. And I can tell you the answer if you wish, or I can help you figure it out for yourself. So I think when, when we see this role of um, quality coach, actually, at least based on the vernacular that I've learned, what we're really looking for is mentoring because we want that person to be able to tell the teams that they're in or the organizations that they're a part of um, how to solve their problems. Okay. So. Why do you want to do that? Because usually when you're asked for something and you just deliver it immediately, you miss a whole bunch of context. So the key point about teaching and mentoring and coaching is not that teaching is bad and coaching is good. It's more that if you don't ask the right questions, there's some significant context that you're going to miss and you could find yourself in a whole world of pain like my friend here, who did not ask the right questions, didn't delve further into the context, and nearly got ambushed by their eight-year-old. Okay? You want to avoid that as a tester. Very, very key. Okay. So, to recap, first you need unconditional positive regard, and that's when you think the person has everything that they need to solve this problem, take advantage of the situation, whatever, they just lack perspective. So I, in my coaching uh, position, can help them gain that perspective so, they, so that they can solve their own problem. And it also helps outside of a coaching context, because when I hear anything that I, as a tester, uh, feel a little bit offended by, I can just chill and not just go into fight, fight, or fight mode. I can actually say, look, why is this true? What, or what makes this true from their perspective? Okay, and then I can use my active listening and my powerful questions to dig into that. And then once I have established what the context is, that I can give them what they need. It could be that I need to tell them something, or it could be that I need to help them figure something out, or I can offer advice. But it's not that one is right, always right, and one is always wrong. It's right or wrong, depending on what the context is. Because you've all been in situations where um, you might be trying to figure out how to implement a thing, and you've searched on Stack Overflow, you've searched all over the internet, you've asked your colleagues, and you say, hey, I've been trying to find a solution to this problem, how do I do it? And they'll say, well, what do you think you should do? <laughs> Just give me the answer, I've spent 10 days on this bloody thing. That's not a coaching situ you know, a coaching response is not helpful. So it really depends on what people need. Uh, and this is just to say that coaching is one leadership style among many, just to re-emphasize that point. So make sure um, that you're using the correct leadership style, correct is the wrong word, the most appropriate leadership style based on the situation. And I think that's the end. Ah, some books. So if you have testers in your life, 
and you would like them uh, to be able to do this, here are some books that I have found massively useful. The first one is Crucial Conversations. That is, that's just a phenomenal book about how to communicate about things when they are important to you, like level 10 important, super important. And you think there's either a choice of, I say nothing and stew and bottle it up, or I just devastate the person who's just, who I need to communicate with and just trash everything about them. There's a third option, and that's what is explained in Crucial Conversations. The Coach's Case Book is a wonderful book. Uh, one of the authors is Kim Morgan. She is the founder of the Barefoot Company where I did my training. Again, this is not an affiliate link. She's just awesome, and so is the book. And the book is a bunch of case studies about different situations where people have um, applied coaching. And it talks about the outcomes and the questions and the things that you can do to approach those different situations. And Coaching for Performance, um, is a, I think it's a seminal book about the GROW model, which is a, uh, a model that people use in coaching. Um, definitely highly recommended and relevant for people like us who work in organizations. So I would highly recommend those three books. Uh, and that is the end. And I rattle through that super fast. Are there any questions, comments, concerns, observations, anything? Feedback, welcome. Are you all quiet? Oh. Questions? Okay. Yell the question, my friend. Yes, I do. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to ask, what was your first encounter as a tester with an agile coach or a scrum master? Oh, yeah, date. That. So the question was, as a tester, what was my first encounter with an agile coach or a scrum master? I'm trying to remember. I think it might have been, oh, it, okay. This is a very dull answer. It was, so. Back in the day, I worked at AOL. They used to be in uh, Hammersmith. Um, I'd never really heard about Agile before, and this Agile coach came in and said, we're going to tell you all about Agile, and it's wonderful. And I was like, ugh, it gets me out of two hours of work. I'll take it. So, uh, but by the end of the afternoon, I was like, Agile evangelist, like, yeah, we're going to do this thing. It is awesome. It's incredible. And what I liked about it, the thing that I remember is I felt like, oh, cool. So the business are going to take, they're going to be responsible for that. And we're going to be responsible for building it. And I'm not going to tell them how to run their business. And they're not going to tell me how to build the thing. But we're going to collaborate and it's going to be awesome. I was like, we should have been doing this forever. Why have we not been doing this before? So this was way back, this was in uh, 2006. Yes, 2006 at AOL. So that was my first run in with Agile proper. Any more for any more? Really? All right. So, from your perspective um, of approaching and being a tester, what's the best way to get testers to just come out of their silo testing and be, be more cross-functional? What would you recommend? What would you be your top tips for that? So the question was, how do you get testers to get out of their, you know, little bubble and operate more across the piece? Is that a fair summary? <laughs> Okay, so what I would do is, using my uh, coaching skills, I would, I would what I'm, the goal is to help them understand that there's more to it than what they are seeing. Okay, and so that would be around, you know, asking them how they may, what else they could have done in a given situation. Like what else is a, what does that mean? That was your 10 minute warning. <laughs> okay. Wow, that was a pretty cool sound effect. Um, yeah, so what else is a really good co coaching question. So you might say, well, how do you see testing? Um, and they will say, blah, 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 blah. And you say, okay, what else? And get them to expand. And you could show people um, examples. And here's another thing that I didn't talk about here. So there are, there are books upon books about how to influence people. One cool one that I read is called Influencer. And it's actually written by the, um, the people who wrote Crucial Conversations wrote the book Influencer. And they have a model in there, I forget exactly what it's called, but I think it's called the Six Factors of Influence. One of those things, one of those levels is the personal. And what that's about is people need to know what's in it for me. Like, why am I even making this change? I don't really care about 
yeah, you say it's all wonderful out here, and I, but that's not how I'm getting measured. Like, this is not going to help me. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, do they have the ability to do the thing that you're asking them? So first thing would be to help get them to talk about how they see testing, because then you'll see where the gaps are compared to your view. And then it's around, OK, let me explain or try and convey somehow what, what the benefit is for them. And then also, you know, bolster that with some training so that they know what to do and not just, OK, I understand what you want me to do, but I don't know how to operate in that situation. Did that help? Yeah. Cool. Any more for any more? Yes. Just not so much a question. Just who was the guy who was uh, dissing manual testing on Twitter? Alan... Alan Holub, that devil. No, no, no. <laughs> cut, cut that from the uh, police. Comment. No, no, no. His, his name was Alan Holub. I, I, it was a weird conversation because obviously there's a bunch of testers. And in fact, not just testers, a bunch of people kind of said, really, that's weird and tried to engage. But I've never met Alan, but I would like to meet Alan. It felt like he was doing it for views because when people were replying, he wasn't really engaging in a way that felt he had any unconditional positive regard. He was just like, I am the great and glorious Alan Hulub, and I've said, it's, it's whack. So if I say it's whack, it's whack. I don't hear what you've got to say. I've told you it's rubbish. It felt like that. Should I, should I try to be charitable? Yeah. I mean. Because I, I think I've also, like you, ended up following him on Twitter, but I can't remember how I came across him. Same. Um, yeah. That's a really good point. I did follow him, and I was like, why is this, why is he, wow, like, I thought we were pals, Alan, like, I don't know what happened. He's done conference talks before, and he was pretty out there then. Oh, is he? Yeah. So, I don't know, maybe he's a controversialist, but what he might be saying is, there are lots of organisations where there is lots of testing that's very routine and automatable, and they don't automate it, and it's kind of nuts. Now, that's quite a long way from some of the sentiments he was You've plugged in some gaps there, yeah. yeah. That's what I thought too, but, and that's what many other folks but I guess thought. His response in the conversation, maybe that's not what he was saying. I think he did think that. The problem was, generally speaking, testers and quality folks on Twitter are not those people. Otherwise, they wouldn't be on Twitter talk, like, in their spare time talking about testing, really. Like, that's not, you know. And actually, just throw another thing. Potentially, you seem missing a distinction between tester and QA, which is a much broader concept. It's maybe his sort yeah. of to some of the narrower concepts of testing, and maybe not so much the, po the quality assurance concept. Yeah, possibly. You know, possibly. Um, the thing is, though, like I said, the word tester, it's a loaded, ter it's like overloaded. It could mean anything, it's like Smurf. It can mean anything to anybody in any situation. So you can either get into like a holy war about the word and what the defin that specific word has this specific definition, or you can talk about, okay, what's the, con what's the idea that you're trying to convey right now? I try and steer, like, stay over there with the idea and the concept rather than saying, well, that word doesn't mean that at all. Because then you just, we've all got better things to do with our time, I think. <laughs> yes? Can you elaborate on uh, being a stunter before Will Smith? Stunter? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so I've been doing this for 20 years. And so my first testing job was at a video game publisher, which has since gone out of business. It's based in North London. Um, and we were super excited in 2003, 4 because we got the license for Bad Boys 2. Amazing, we were so excited. Um, sadly, because we were small and lame, please take that out from the video as well. Uh, uh, the license that we had did not allow us to use the likenesses of any of the stars in the film. So what do you do when you have a very handsome uh, black lead in a film, and indeed a very handsome tester in the test department, who was also a black dude, you know where I'm going with this, people. <laughs> That's right, they took my face and put it in the game. But plot twist, I was actually Martin Lawrence, Lawrence originally, and my wonderful friend Phil was Will, which I thought was beautiful, Phil Will, okay? Thing is, <laughs> Phil actually looks like Will Smith for real, like he really does. So when the powers that be saw his face on there, they were like, uh, no, 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 no. We need to swap that, so I got an upgrade. 
Will Smith? Will Smith downgraded horribly <laughs> to me. <laughs> so yeah, that's why I am Will Smith's virtual stunt double. Man, listen, he's ki that story was so much more pleasant up until about March. And then he lost his mind. So I'm not going to slap anybody here today. Um, everyone's looking a bit too big. This guy here is like, I'm not slapping you, sir. No chance. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the story. Yes. I don't, I honestly don't know. I'm trying to predict that is kind of weird. Um, or I find it difficult is what I probably mean. I think, I think there's the, a, a demand from the market to be more technical, and that's true. But I think being more technical is broader than saying that you are able to code. So if there are any testers out there that have not like twigged that, they need to sort that out. Like I don't code. Like if you, the way I think about testing is when I'm trying to test something, I'm trying to take a perspective of the people involved, um, the technology involved, and the business domain that we're in. And I focus on people. I'm a people person just naturally anyway. So I've, that's why I've gone down this coaching angle. But the technical part is, is not going anywhere. As technology advances, we've already had things like you know crypto and Internet of Things. There was a friend of mine, I don't know if he's in here, he's probably in the other talk, but he's working on quantum computing. Ridiculous. How the hell are you going to test a quantum computer? So it's like learning about these domains. As the technologies appear, it would be wise for testers to just you know, start to dabble and understand those things, I think. OK. Thank you very much. <laughs>